So by a raise of your right hands, everyone raise your hand, <laughs> that would actually dedicate an hour of their life saving another's. I think that's everybody, right? That's what I thought. So that's a good thing, because after that, that's your unwritten contract that you're going to meet me after here, and we got a job for you. In 2006, I received my first call for the Dover Air Force Base Honor Guard after rigorous weeks of training. And when me and my team showed up at 12 a.m. at night, we were quickly notified that we were responsible for performing the dignified and honorable transfer of 29 of our brothers and sisters in uniform for paying the ultimate sacrifice during wartime. And that night, when we were standing on the K-loaders next to the C-5 galaxies on the flight line, with wind blowing at 30 miles an hour, wind chill at 20 degrees, and raining, hailing, and snowing sideways, we all stood admirably next to our fallen brothers and sisters with their flag-draped, American flag-draped transfer cases, delicately wrapped. And that was our first job, my first job anyway. And I, one thought in particular that popped in my mind, that day, I was studying for an exam that was due the next morning at 0800. And when I got the call, I was a little frustrated and a little bit stressed until I came in standard formation. We turned to our cases, went down, and pulled it up. And then I had a thought. We stood up ceremoniously. At that point, I realized that nothing in my life mattered if I could have an opportunity to achieve something else, and I have the opportunity to fail again. These service members have no more time. They're gone, and neither are their families. Forward! <laughs> that night, we spent the next five hours nonstop, slowly, ceremoniously, for all 29 of those service members. Five hours till 5 a.m. in the morning. And we, it doesn't matter if we had our hands frozen from frostbite or tear, frozen tears on our face, because even while you're doing your duty, you have feelings too. You just still manage to control that emotion, or at least your physical posture, and continue to perform honorably for the families, for everyone. Do you see the honor guard is only one small piece of a long chain of events from the point of where our service members decease all the way back to their hometowns and their loved ones. When they come into Dover Air Force Base, they're ceremoniously brought, ceremoniously brought into the port mortuary where they're delicately wrapped and dressed and to perfection, everyone that touches and everyone of, during the trail, anyone that actually interfaces with these troops, their lives change forever. How did it change for me? Well, first, that next year, a year later, we had already unfortunately performed the transfer of over 140 lives. Families impacted during wartime, that lives were changed forever, not just for them, but for us, because we were the ones standing there honorably carrying their family. And I recall every holiday, almost every holiday. Could anyone imagine bringing your son home on Mother's Day or Father's Day or your brother? So it, it, it left a big resonation in a lot of our hearts. But I decided I, there was something I've been searching for a long time I wanted to do, and I wanted to give back. Fortunately, I, got in the, I was blessed to get into the Air Force in the world of technology as an IT specialist. And that was a blessing to me because it changed my life. It was the best opportunity I ever had. So I decided I was going to use that to bring more of our brothers and sisters back home so they can embrace and breathe the same breathing air over the next however many years, several years. But I also wasn't going to stop there. I was going to serve the communities that I grew up in, the, the communities that were struggling with idle hands and uh, not a lack of opportunity. And back then, when I was that age, there was no, the technology we have now didn't even exist. So I decided while I was working an hour, uh, 40 hours a week over there at the Dover Air Force Base, while we also did Honor Guard. I also donated an hour of my lunch time every day to go over to our local middle school where I mentored a group of kids. And mentors are key in our lives, many lives that don't have those mentors. These kids were probably getting bad grades not because they have bad parents, because I met every one of them. Their, their, their parents are thankful to have somebody else to step in and be a positive role model for them. And what I did was try to go to these kids, meet these kids, and try to find a positive fuel in their life and it, take my light and my heart and share it to theirs. So teach them how to be productive, practice, perfection, how to clean their lockers. And in that time, I also exposed them to the, my world of technology, which set the fire off inside. The amazing thing is, less than 10 years ago, two of those students graduated with master's degrees. 
Think if we all did that, how many lives we can save. So unfortunately, I was transferred over to Maryland from, in 2000, uh, 2008 to transfer over to my next duty station. And when I did, I'd been brokenhearted for a long time. Yes, I, got the, uh, I had the opportunity to train this amazing enterprise team that served the globe of IT specialists. But I still had an absence in my heart because I no longer had time to service the community. After driving 15 plus hours a week and then working another 40 plus hours, you don't really have a lot of time to share with anybody else but your family. But still, I felt broken inside until a couple years ago. A couple years ago, if everybody recalls, actually a year ago. In fact, today marks the day that I started this program, a year ago. So I had this vision. I, I went to sleep, had a very bad dream because of the communities, the clashing of all these different communities, and I woke up with a vision. The vision was to unite people. See, at that time, even now today, America's polarized. I think everybody would agree. Everybody focuses on a reason to drive each other apart, and everybody focuses on a way to distance each other, and all that does is create a bigger divide. What if we all ch chose to find a way to bring us together and find that one common thread? Mine was Cyber Streets. I was going to take computers and keyboards and replace that idle time that got these kids in situations where they could expo get exposure to gang violence, where they could get exposure to addiction, where they could get exposure to incarceration or even death. I wanted to take those keyboards and change their lives. I wanted to take my passion for technology and give back to my community, so I did. And I put it into motion. Within three months, we had 70 kids connected across, across three amazing community centers. The Green Beret Project, for example, is a group of amazing veterans, school people, uh, teachers, local businesses that are coming in to, to, into the inner city of our Dover area to support these kids and pull them out. I just brought them the technology and education platform. The Inner City Cultural League is an uh, uh, inner city cultural arts area. They don't have technology there. So I brought it to them, and they're running it now. We're building a STEM program in the next six to eight months for the state. You all just don't know that yet. STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's very important in our world. Why? Because these kids don't know that it's there. They, the tech, I figured if I could take that technology and pass it on to them and build that passion and find the way, that would be amazing. So. Now, we've already connected all these kids, and over summer, we connected quite a few more. But what we're doing, what we're doing with these kids, one center, they had no computers at all. We went in there and got recycled computers from com companies like SecureNetMD, and they donated them to us, and we're recycling those computers, and I'm in there teaching those kids how to rebuild the network cables and build a network that they can use to train, because they don't know how to use their technology. I'm teaching them to use these phones, these, these devices, that they're playing their apps, in their games and focusing on a one a consolidated repository of free online re open source training environments collectively onto cyberstreets.org. So now we're empowering them because at the end of the day, technology is the only, it's the only lev level playing field for everybody. Technology does not uh, discriminate in any way, shape, or form. If you have a desire to succeed, you can take technology and make your future with it. And that's what we're doing. We're teaching these kids not only how to rebuild computer centers, we're teaching them how to get STEM education. We're teaching them how to pursue and go after IT certifications that also apply toward college credits. And we're also connecting them to online free college courses so they don't have to go broke, so they have a hope. It's all about hope. There's a story, an Indian Cherokee story, called the Parable of Two Wolves. Some may be familiar with it, but in that story, an Indian grandfather comes to his grandson and says, Grandson, there's a story of these two wolves that are at war within us. They're always battling every day. One, hope, one, one wolf is hopelessness, despair, and the other one is love and light. And the grandson looks at grandfather and says, Grandfather, which one wins if they're always fighting? And he looks back at him and he said, Whichever one you choose to feed. I chose to feed that positive wolf. Although I've come from a community with flag-bearing coffins and I come through a community that I know what it feels like to get pulled over every time I have a black man in the car. I understand that. But my conversations were doing nothing. I could not pull people together to get them to understand and have that little level of empathy. So I had to stand up, talk less, do more, take action, and make IT, make it happen. 
And here we are today. In fact, six months later, shortly after I started the program in our community, I told you about the 140 lives that we transferred in for the families and their, of our fallen soldiers. Well, by the end of summer, through three community centers, we had already connected 140 kids to, in our lo little community to 140 kids to a world of opportunity. They see a future. They're motivated. I'm only one man with an idea. We all have ideas. I spent over 3,000 hours in the last year supporting this program. I'm only one man. Just imagine, here's an idea worth spreading. What if we all chose to pick that positive wolf, not ignore the dark wolf, but focus on that positive wolf and unite and find that common thread that brings us together? A statistic for schools. 2%, less than 2% right now, less than 2% of stu students who graduate from high school actually make it to the professional athletes. Yet, I think everybody can agree that they have many athletic programs. Where's the other 98% go? However, a critical crux, this is why technology is important to our country and our future of our cyber national security. Right now, if everybody knows the stats, we're between, right today, for the last two years, between 300 and 500,000 manpower deficiency in the IT and cyber workforce. Guess where we're going to be at by 2020? We're projected to be at 2 million. Colleges and schools are doing a great job, but they can't keep up with the flux, so we've got to find another way. Cyber Streets is a start, but there's a, another bunch of amazing people here in front of us right now that could help do that as well. Let's step out of that side of that box, become a mentor, donate an hour a week to contributing to something in your community. And if we all did that, I think everybody would agree that our world would be a better place because then we would be the positive example for our children. See, over the last couple of years, I don't think we as a country have been a good positive example for our kids for the most because what we see on the media and on the news, unfortunately, is a lot of segregation and division. Yet, you look at our governments right now, they're polarized. You look at our schools and our communities and our, our businesses, they're polarized. Nobody really wants to step outside of themselves, put something else first and work together. It's time for a change. It's time for us to make that happen. So here's an idea worth spreading. Let's come together, come find that one common fiber that brings us and unites us as a country and a nation and a planet. You know what that is? It's our children. Our children. Because they are our future. And if united we stand, united they will grow. So we're dedicated to committing and contributing a positive environment for our children and our future and our communities. Our local city has pulled together a bunch of community centers that didn't work together before. We've already saturated the state and we've been a part of, included in multiple STEM alliances across the state. It's time for us to learn for those kids that set that example for everybody else. If we can't do it ourselves and unite, pull each other together and let's make this happen. I'm ready to change the world. Our city's ready to change the world in Dover. Our organizations of all these great nonprofits and community outreach programs are ready to change the world. My question is how about you? Thank you.